low levels of negative effects in addition to high subjective life satisfa satis satisfaction. Audomonic well-being focuses more on the creation of meaning the purpose in life, although the distinction between these two concepts is subject to debate. The notion of authentic happiness has been further broken down by Seligman to indicate a life that is com combination of a pleasurable life, an engaged life and a meaningful life. The pleasurable life encompasses feelings of positive emotions, which are integral components to our success and well-being. Positive emotions widen our thought process, which can be built up over time and banked to create a product productive reservoir open which a person can draw from during unpleasant or distressing times. The engaged life focuses on flow, engagement, absorption and well-being, while the meaningful life encompasses service to something higher than the self. Thus, individuals can find happiness with the pursuit of all three lives. At present, the concept of authentic happiness is more a theory than a casual recipe for happiness. A positive psychology continues to grow and develop more longitudinal data banks we will know more about how these three leaves work in harmony to enhance well-being. Think about it. Sheldon, 2009, defines authenticity as emotional genuineness self attunement and psychological depth. Humanists originally believed that you could not study such abstract concepts, whereas other theorists, such as Freud, believed that one could never be authentic. 1. Do you agree or disagree with these arguments? 2. Can you think of a time when you have been truly authentic or inauthentic to yourself? 3. How do you know when you are being truly authentic? The Origins of Modern Day Positive Psychology The person regarded as being responsible for the creation of the positive psychology moment is Martin E. P. Seligman, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. After decades of experimental research and success with his learned helplessness theory, Seligman was appointed president of the American Psychological Association, APA, in 1998. It was during his inauguration at the 107th Annual Convention of the APA in Boston, Massachusetts, 21 August 1999, that Seligman decided to introduce his agenda to correct the trajectory of modern-day pathologically focused psychology. Since Seligman's presidential position, he has become a figurehead for the positive psychology movement and continues to gain support from research funds and governments across the world to include positive psychology 
theories and practices into daily life. Roses Although not an experiment, the story of Seligman and his rose garden has become a folk legend in the discipline of positive psychology. By his account, positive psychology started from an epiphany he experienced while attending to his rose garden. His daughter, who was five at the time, had been trying to get her father's attention. Seligman turned to her and snapped. Unhappy with this response, his daughter asked him whether or not he remembered how she used to whine when she was three and four. She told him not. She told him that when she turned five, she decided to stop and if she was able to stop whining. Then he was able to stop being a grudge. This revelation of developing what was right, rather than fixating on what was wrong, sparked what Seligman would go on to promote during his career as APA president, that we should be teaching our children and ourselves to look at our strengths rather than weaknesses. Psychology as usual Pre-1998 Unbeck known to the general psychology population, there were three tasks of psychology prior to World War II. These were to 1. Cure mental illness 2. Enhance the lives of the normal population 3. Study geniuses Due to the aftermath of two world wars and the return of many psychologically impaired soldiers, research funding focused on its first agenda, with the other two nearly forgotten. We must acknowledge that this funding for mental disorders has been immensely successful as at least 14 disorders can now be cured or considerably relieved. Seligman and Chisk San Mihaly, 2000 Unfortunately, these fixations on pathology led the psychology becoming a victimology. Instead of viewing humans as proactive, creative, self-determinant beings, psychologists viewed humans as passive individuals subjected to external forces. Hence, the main difference between post-World War II Psychology and today's positive psychology is in the question asked, why do these individuals fail, versus what makes some individuals succeed? The message of the positive psychology movement is to remind our field that it has been deformed. Psychology is not just the study of disease, weakness, and damage. It also is the study of strength and virtue. Treatment is not just fixing what is wrong. It also is building what is right. Psychology is not just about illness or health. It is about work, education, insight, law, growth, and play, and 
in this quest for what is best. Positive psychology does not rely on wishful thinking, self-deception or hand-waving. Instead, it tries to adopt what is best in the scientific method to the unique problems that human behavior presents in all its complexity. Think about it. From 1972 to 2006, the ratio of depression research publications to well-being publications was 5.1. We challenge you to undertake your own calculations on physic info to see where the ratio is currently at today. Depression and mental illness. Depression and mental illness are still important issues within our society and positive psychology. Researchers do not negate this. Indeed, statics indicating the occurrence of depression were and are still worrying. Depression was 10 times higher in 2009 than it was in 1960, with the mean age for depression today being 14.5. Compared to 29.5 in 1960. Furthermore, at any one time, about 2% of the population is suffering from depression and 14% of us will experience depression by the age of 35. Compared to person in 1950s. The results of the global burden of disease study 1996 found depression to be among the top five illnesses contributing to disability in the life adjusted years. The total number of years a person lives with disabilities. Indeed, mental disorder came only second to cardiovascular disease. Mental illness costs the USA over $40 billion per annum and this figure continues to rise. Staggering new studies suggest, suggest that up to 50% of us will experience some mental disorder in our lifetime. Furthermore, once we have experienced a mental disorder, we are far more likely to experience another again in the future. The rise in documented occurrences may also be due to the reduced stigma involved in seeking help for depression in addition to public awareness of mental disorders. Disease Model Debate Originally, the idea of positive psychology was to move away from the disease model which fixated on moving people from A, 8 to 3 or severely depressed to mildly depressed. Positive psychology, on the other hand, situated its focus on people who fell at plus three, languishing, and helped to rise them to a plus 
8 flourishing. We find this model an easy, simple visual when teaching our students to differentiate between the main aims of positive psychology. Of course, the analogy is simple and did the trick at a time when clarification between the psychologies was needed. However, this theoretical model assumes that people can be at zero. But what is zero? And what does it really mean to be plus three? The model assumes that positive psychology cannot help those on the negative end of the scale. However, we now have evidence that positive psychology interventions can benefit people who are diagnosed as clinically depressed in addition to the normal population. Furthermore, the diagram calls into question the meaning of health. What exactly is health and when do we exhibit mental health versus mental illness? Since 1948, the World Health Organization has defined health as a state of complete physical mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. In 1958, Austrian psychologist Mary Jehoda wrote her major contribution to psychology titled Ideal Mental Health, which listed six criteria or six characteristics found within the normal population. 1. Efficient self-perception 2. Realistic self-esteem and acceptance 3. Voluntary control of behavior 4. True perception of the world 5. Sustaining relationships and giving affection and 6. Self-direction and productivity She argued that these six criteria were needed to establish positive mental health. Her studies were amongst the first to attempt to operationalize positive functioning and her findings are not far diverse from what we know about mental health and well-being today. Corey Case, a shining example of a positive psychologist, has spent years looking at the relationship between mental health and mental illness. His work brought him to conclude that the two are not on the same continuum and that they are two separate continuums. Thus, the absence of mental illness does not equate to the presence of mental health. As research has continually found that the absence of mental health is a damaging as the presence of mental illness. Case proposed two strategies for tackling mental disorder. 1. The promotion and maintenance of mental health. 2. The prevention and treatment of mental illness. History of Positive Psychology One of the criticism of positive psychology is that the ideas are not new. Even the term positive psychology was used by Abraham Maslow 
many decades before Seligman. However, Seligman has done a phenomenal job of bringing the thoughts and ideas of past researchers, philosophers and scientists back to our consciousness. We have identified four groups of individuals who were looking at the good life before the discipline of positive psychology even existed. Let's begin with the ancient Greeks. Greeks, Aristotle, 384, 322 BCE. Greatest contribution to philosophy is arguably his work on morality, virtue, and what it means to live a good life. As he questioned these topics, he concluded that the highest good for all humanity was indeed eudaimonia, or happiness. Ultimately, his work argued that although pleasure may arise from engaging with activities that are virtuous, it is not the sole aim of humanity.